You're experiencing the Authentic Chaos Podcast, an exploration into our inner selves and journeys of self-discovery. Mm, it feels good to say that again. Hey folks, it's me, Vahagen, just hosting by myself again today. Uh, it's been a while since I've come on the back on the pod. I took a little bit of a break, kind of needed a mental rest, and you know, we're getting to the point of the one year marker of this podcast, which I it's been it's been a really fun journey for me. We've had a lot of really cool conversations and a lot of really uh, nice reflections. And I think what's been making me like wh- one of the things that's been giving me pause about doing this episode, this next episode is that I kind of felt like I was running out of things to talk about and then But in doing so, I kind of realized that there were so many things to talk about. I just haven't quite figured out how to say them. So I want this episode to be a bit of a reaffirmation of what this podcast is. And part of that is about is going to be based on what I've been doing over the past month and why I've been not able to come up with something to say because I've been just coming up with so many things to think about. And it's been inspired by this book that's right next to me, Godel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid. Now, this book was suggested to me by a friend and I was, uh, you know, I had put it on my to-do list as a to, to read and um, reserved it from the library. I noticed it's a very popular book, so quite a few people had it reserved. And then before I knew it, after a few months, having completely forgotten that I even like talked to, heard about this book, it came to me. It was my turn to reserve it. All I knew about this book going into it is that it was roughly a book on AI, and it was written in the 70s, revised in the 90s. And so I was I was interested because I've been in the AI field or I've worked in the AI field for several years and it's something that I am definitely interested in. I'm also, as you know, the whole point of this podcast is my interest in self-reflection and kind of understanding what is understanding. Reflections on the self to which I refer to as my authentic chaos. And Addressing this book felt very similar to uh, addressing this episode or even addressing myself and reflecting on myself. I saw this, and let me show you the side. It is this thick tome, 700 pages of pretty pretty intense work and very cognitive. It was a very cognitive book. Reading this book felt like... I was taking a course. I I was taking a course on some of the most abstract material that I could think of, but it was both abstract and very relatable, which made it even stranger. And But first, looking at the book, I was dreading it. And I think that expectation made it difficult for me to want to get into it. Similarly to the expectation of doing this episode, this this, this, uh, anim celebration of the podcast, was a difficult thing to do, similar to how for years diving deeper into my own sense of self and my own understanding of myself was difficult. Every case of these, there were expectations that were blocking me from diving deeper and understanding more and just going and flowing. And here, as I read and so to describe the book, It starts with a simple concept. So this book is really a book about consciousness, but it's not a book authoritatively about consciousness. It is a book that describes consciousness in the most self-referential way because ultimately consciousness is self-referential. Being self-aware is a self-reference. And the author shows that in uh, that rule systems can, that have self-reference, strange things happen to them. 
for some context. In the early 1900s, the mathematicians were trying to come up with a complete and consistent theory of numbers. What this means is that everything within these rule systems uh, would be true. All of the theorems about numbers in this rule system would be true. And there it would contain every single rule system that is true about numbers. It was intended to show us everything that we need to know about natural numbers. And these are numbers starting, uh, all, whole numbers starting from zero going up. Um, and it, it was a collection of everything that we had known about numbers at the time. And it was a revolutionary work and it was a tome about this thick. And it was beautiful, but the first author, the, or the, so the first name, Gödel, came in. Uh, Kurt Gödel had this, came up with this theorem called the incompleteness theorem. And his theorem was saying, his argument was, if this book, if this rule system of numbers is so complete that it has every true statement, then I will make up a new theorem. And he called it, uh, he said, the theorem G is not provable within this uh, this number theory rule system. And what that meant was that either the rule system itself was incomplete because it did not contain this rule, this uh, this new theorem, or it does contain the theorem, in which case it is now inconsistent because not all of the theorems within the rule system are true. And this upended, like, generations of dogma about math and about how we understood numbers and it showed that when you ha even and when you have a simple rule system just trying to describe logic a logical rule system that is self-referential weird things happen there start to get hierarchies so it was established that okay so if you have this th theorem uh, this rule system that and this theorem that cannot be in the rule system. Well, what if you made a new rule system? The old rule system plus this new theorem. Now it should now it contains that theorem and it's great. Okay. Well, what if I said that there is a new theorem that is now not provable within this new system? And they say, okay, well, we'll just use that new the old the new system and then update the new system. Now this is the newer system. I say, well. Now there is a theorem that is not provable within the newer system. And then so on and so on and so on. And this repeats and can repeat ad infinitum. And so this showed that like, okay, this these systems of rules, once they ha are self-referential, have the ability to step out of themselves. But in doing so, actually step into a new system that is higher than that. Okay, well, this is sounding abstract, right? Like maybe it's not, uh, maybe this is just a rule system for numbers. Well, then he looks at the genetic code in this book. And he says, well, the genetic code is kind of similar. We know that DNA is, we refer to it as DNA as like the code, the genetic code, literally, like the code of how, our, how life is formed. And it's true, the DNA does have the code that determines what proteins get created, but it also creates the codes for the enzymes that act on the DNA. So, okay, so now the so now it creates these enzymes, and the enzymes use DNA as an input. So DNA is not just code, it's also data. Okay, well, but if the DNA is also producing the enzymes, then it's also creating the thing that is interpreting the DNA. Okay, so now the genetic code is not just the genetic code, it's the genetic data and the genetic interpreter. And there, there are these like loops within just DNA that happen to form, form life, form the differentiation of cells, form life as we know it. Okay, well, maybe it's just a maybe this, these uh, hierarchies and loops are just a, a a feature of math and you know basic biology. Well, what about what about consciousness? When when a sentient being is becomes smart enough that it is conscious, it is aware of things. Well, what happens if that awareness? 
turns inward to itself. Then you get self-awareness. And oh, but why why is that such a a known concept now? It may, it seems so obvious that you have self-awareness as well as awareness, but it wasn't always so obvious. Generations ago, self-awareness was something that was left to the philosophers or shamans or gurus or uh, or the most fringe. The concept of being aware of yourself could have been considered demonic at times or angelic, depending on your point of view. And so now we think of it as so simple, but maybe that's because we have gotten so used to it that we've stepped out of our previous systems. And who's to say that that's the end? What about self-self-consciousness? Being conscious of the way that you are being conscious of yourself. Well, that that sounds kind of wild, right? Like even to think of it, even to construct that sentence was a challenge to me because it's not something that I'm very familiar with thinking, let alone communicating. And maybe it's a sentence that didn't really make much sense to you, but maybe in a couple generations, like self self consciousness will be such a common thing, or I guess it would be self consciousness consciousness. Anyway, it would be such a common thing that we would just be used to it. And what this book, and so as I was reading this book, I was kind of figuring out both who I am and what this podcast is and who other people are and what people in the past must have felt when they were like coming up with tenets for new religions and how we are now recognizing levels of sentience and consciousness that we never really considered before. Decades ago, children weren't really considered conscious. They were considered like little robots. But now we understand that they are aware of themselves at a very young age. We used to think that animals were not conscious. But we know that many animals can form friendships, platonic relationships, or seemingly platonic relationships. We know that they can have a, they have emotions and can express themselves. But to have a relationship with another animal and to even have something to express, wouldn't that require some sort of self or at least maybe the burgeoning of a sense of self? So maybe this isn't a unique thing to us, but is this broader, more beautiful connection, this like empathetic web that we can, we're all tied to. And this is the, this is the, the subtitle of the book, An Eternal Golden Braid. What if the things that are stopping us from really connecting with each other are our expectations, our expectations of how people are going to act or how people are going to think, of, or more importantly, of how we're going to act or how we're going to think? I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, someone who I haven't really chatted much with, but we had such a lively and deep conversation and we got a good sense of how we like the levels of self-consciousness that we had for ourselves and some of the problems that we had. He mentioned that it's lovely to be self-conscious, but there's pain in it. There's pain in seeing the things that other people recognize as strange, that other people can ostracize and being like, why am I like this? Why am I this way? What is this chaos within me? Because it is chaos. It is what we are on the inside, what we, who we are authentically is chaotic. It is unknown. It is different. It is us. We are unique through our concept of being able to reflect on ourselves and create new concepts based on these reflections. And that's what makes our authentic chaos so beautiful. And But it's scary once you when you th- see the shadows of you through your self-reflection and you and you don't know where they came from or you don't want to even consider them i've talked about this before that our shadows seem like demons when seen from the in from maybe not the best perspective 
And that's where self-awareness and awareness that we need to change our perspective can help us see it in a different light. Just like I saw this book in a different light. At first, I saw it as this big monstrosity, this like a book of the size that what I would read in like high school and like and like really regret doing. But and the beginning of it was so challenging for me because I had to like really think about a level of math and logic that I haven't really thought about in a long time and really just understand what was going on. And, and that was it was a very difficult start. But once I got past it and once I pushed away these expectations of what I thought it would be, it got easier. And in fact, it didn't get just get easier. I was so excited to read it. I've been so excited about this book because it is having it is getting me to think on such a new level. And it is it feels so good to hear other people describe their understanding of self in a way that resonates with me so much and it feels so real and it feels so consistent with my lived experiences <clears throat> and likewise even thinking looking into this episode <clears throat> i was worried about what i was going to say or how it was going to come out because these thoughts in my head through this book are so new and it is so complicated to even ingest the author's words and his story and it really does feel like i'm i'm like downloading some of his brain into mine and his understanding into mine through his prose and it, and but um so i was worried about how it was going to come out in in words because i first have to be able to understand it so i'm only skimming the surface of what I've reflected on and what I've learned and over the next years I'm really excited to see how my philosophy keeps developing and how my understanding of myself and my understanding of my understanding of myself grows because I think that's where the beauty is when you push to the edge of who you are through exploring who you are or what you are you make yourself more nuanced, more you, more authentically chaotic. And that's what we love. That's what I love about this podcast. And what I love about learning about these things and talking to people is that I learn the things to ask, the questions to ask to figure out who you are on a deeper level. Sometimes I don't understand myself. Most of the times, people don't quite understand me, and that's okay. It's a journey. Understanding isn't meant to be something that happens immediately. Even understanding what understanding is, is complicated. Understanding should require a bit of vulnerability and honesty with ourselves that there is it is there is no end to the journey that we should be open minded and open hearted and open souled or however you want to think of it and accept in the the lessons that we have for each other looking back at doing this episode I'm glad I'm doing it not because I'm pushing myself to do it but because I wanted to share the beauty of self-reflection and authentic chaos and I wanted this to be my reaffirmation of what we're trying to do and yeah I'm, I'm really starting to think about how what are some what are more ways that I can help other people with thinking about these questions and getting past the blocks of your sha of our shadows so that way we can see ourselves as more, as more complete. As we can see ourselves as these strange loops, as, as Hofstadter puts it. These, these systems of logic, these systems of rules that are aware of ourselves and thus can change the rules and change ourselves. We are in control of shaping ourselves, shaping our soul, shaping our mind, 
shaping who we are, shaping who we want to be, shaping how we see the world. But it requires work. It requires a journey. And I'm here to take that journey with you. And I hope you'll keep taking this journey with me into this next year as we continue the odyssey that is authentic chaos. So thank you, listeners, for joining me on these musings of Godel Escherbach and Eternal Golden Braid and musings on myself and my understanding of consciousness and musings on the podcast as a whole and musings of this episode as a whole because you know, beautiful things happen when we start to reference ourselves. And that self-reference makes strange things happen. And beauty, that's where we come in. So thank you again for listening. And as always, embrace your chaos with kindness. Thank you so much. <laughs>